Welcome to the European Parliament in Brussels. I'm Ben, and uh, we've got uh, Manon Opi and also Martin Schiervan with us this morning for uh, a, a big week here in uh, the European Parliament. Usually we'd be in Strasbourg, but because of the pandemic, which we'll talk about uh, very soon, um, this is a, a big week because of the State of the Union, a set piece for uh, the Commission to set out their agenda for the next year and beyond. And uh, of course, we're in the midst of a pandemic. We've got a migration crisis still ongoing. We've got many other problems to deal with. So she will present tomorrow morning here a very rosy picture. I think uh, that's what Manon uh, likes to think. And of course, Martin, you think that in her 10 months so far in office, she's achieved virtually nothing. And you followed her career for a long time as former defence minister <laughs> and, uh, you know, one failure in Germany. Javis Cooper about her. Exactly. So, Martin, what do you think of her? Uh, what she will say and also how will we pay for this? Well, actually, she started with the promise to take the European Union into the future, huh? as far as I remember. And she was uh, referring to the twin trans uh, transition of the European Union, the digital and the ecological transition. Well, of course, we have to take into account, we have to be fair here as well, that then the pandemic hit also um, the European uh, societies and that everything came to an abrupt halt, also politics in at least certain areas. But then she could not only not deliver and live up to her promises, she could not even resolve the crisis that hit the European Union. So we were waiting for weeks and for months until Ursula von der Leyen could present somehow, but not even a coherent strategy and plan how to get Europe out of the crisis, how to start to organize the economic and social recovery. And still we are missing a coherent uh, approach in dealing with the health crisis. And Manon, the crisis, yes, interrupted her first year, should we say, she had all these grand plans, but. You can say March, April, May time, the, the Commission really didn't have a plan. And, and how would you say they are now six months down the line? Well, it seems like we haven't learned from the mistakes, the ones that have, that have been done at the beginning of the pandemics when it was a big mess because, you know, all of the countries in Europe were just competing against each other, which for me is for now at least, the true picture of what the European Union is. Instead of being a cooperation space where uh, countries cooperate together, for example, to fight climate change because it's a global uh, issue and challenge, so it has to be also dealt uh, globally, at least at the EU level. But the same goes for the, the pandemic because I just what we all remember is countries stealing each other, masks, for example, um, and when you're not able to organize solidarity, you might, one might think, you know, uh, for sure they couldn't plan for uh, the, the, the crisis, you know, it emerged all of a sudden, etc. Mm, I think they still did mistake, but fair enough. Now we're six months later, and the same goes on. The same goes on that all of us are depending on China to get some of the masks and we're competing against each other to get them. And the same goes on that there are no common criteria on whether a, a place is a red zone or not. And, and they're keeping on doing the same mistakes. Like, um, you know, for years and years, austerity has killed our hospitals. And what are they doing now? is to start again what we call the European semester, which are austerity criteria imposed on EU states. For years and years, um, we, the, the EU, not we, but the EU developed free trade agreements um, and they really killed our EU industry. And the same goes on. Like during the pandemics, they signed a new e, uh, uh, free trade agreement with Mexico. So it seems like we doing over and over the mistakes and you know what uh, Ursula von der Leyen will uh, do this week? We call it the State of the Union. But to see the future for the State of the Union, you have to be clear once what's wrong at the moment. The fact that we're living an economic crisis, a social crisis, an ecological crisis. If you don't look at it, you know, fairly and with clarity, then you do the, you know, the, your your messages, your answers, your policies, then are, are mistakes and. 
I feel that's the path they're and taking. May I jump yes. in here then, please, in Manon, because you are completely right. I think the handling of the pandemic and the crisis just clearly emphasized the divergences that, that exist in the European Union. Mm. For instance, when it comes to the question of solidarity, you already mentioned it. The Frugal Four didn't want to support, let's say, those countries who suffered the most from the pandemic and will suffer in the future the most from the economic and social consequences. Then, of course, there is the question of the rule of law that is also part of the political debate now, but it clearly shows that there are different cultural understandings of, and democratic understandings of how we want to live together here in the European Union. And the pandemic only emphasized, and the handling of the pandemic by the European Commission, how huge the divergences are actually in the European Union. Yeah, and, and some of the comments we got from our followers on social media um, in a run-up to this uh, broadcast, one of them simply said, the EU is broken. Um, but many of them also said, the youth are once again paying for the cost of this crisis with unemployment and this lack of solidarity that you've mentioned, and it's all economic interests, deep inequality on all fronts, basically, but also fascism is on the rise. So you know, for human rights, for fundamental rights, for civil rights. There are lots of issues that she has to deal with tomorrow, but fundamentally, how will she pay for the crisis? Well, we could give her some good advice, I think, but what she has planned so far and what she presented last time when she presented the Recovery and Resilience Facility and her ideas of the multi financial framework, it was actually not sufficient because we have to address proper own resource regime and we have to introduce a proper own resource regime in the European Union in order to pay back the credits that will be um, and the loans that the Commission will um, uh, take at the stock markets. No. Borrow, yeah. Borrow at the From stock the, markets. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We'll borrow at the stock markets and that clearly we need to have a convincing and coherent plan on how to pay this money back otherwise you and me and everybody else will have to pay it back from their own pockets by giving it to the states. Those will give it to the European Union and then it will be paid back from, from the, or by the Commission to, then, to the stock markets again. And this is ridiculous. So we need a proper own resources regime and we are discussing and proposing the introduction of a comprehensive financial transaction tax, for instance. Not only taxing shares, but also the high frequency trade and also the derivatives, yeah. which would bring a lot of money into the pockets actually of the member states and also the European Union. Like, let me make an estimate, an educated guess here, more than 50 billions is the estimate. If you come up with a clear proposal for a comprehensive per year, for a clear comprehensive proposal for a financial transaction tax. And same goes for the digital taxation yeah. of big tech, of uh, digital companies, etc., etc. We are still waiting for a comprehensive proposal on how to tax the digital economy. And this is something we need to put forward urgently and we have our ideas and I'm sure Manon will present them tomorrow <laughs> and we will always present them in the next couple of days but and just weeks. To, maybe to jump in on the issue of uh, who will pay the price of the crisis, just maybe to step back a little bit, some people have already paid the price of the crisis. You know, the, the, the one who were on the front of the war, because they like to call it a war, but they, there were some people already who pay a very high price. Um, the ones, in, in particular the youth, um, were entering, uh, um, you know, uh, <laughs> a new life where it's very hard to find a job. Uh, there were so many jobs that were lost over the last couple of months. Uh, the unemployment rate already increased by 1% uh, across the European Union, which is one of the highest increase. So some people have, are already paying the price of the crisis. That's the first thing. And then the second thing on own resources, just to be clear, it's, um, there's no other solution. Otherwise, it's, it will be the states that will pay back. And the states mean all of us, mean all of the unfair taxes like VAT. And again, what's, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the people who are losing a lot from the crisis, but there are people who are making money out of the crisis. Think about the supermarkets. Think about Jeff Bezos and Amazon. Yeah. And there was a study from Oxfam from last week that says that if Jeff, Jeff Bezos wouldn't have increased his wealth, that is already very, very high, he could have paid $100,000 for each of the single employees of Amazon. 
that stat just sums up you know, the level of inequalities and there are people who are making money and those people need to be taxed, whether on the wealth tax individually, but also companies that are making money. And that's very key for ordinary people not to pay the price of the crisis. There is money, but we need to get them in the, in the right pockets. Um, we don't have long, but I want to also bring up climate, um, the, the, what her proposals would be, which is, I think, to cut emissions from, uh, from 40 to 50, uh, raise emissions, uh, cut emissions to 55%. That's her proposal, but our group wants 65 or above. So again, whatever she says tomorrow will not be satisfactory to, to uh, Martin. And Manon, but Martin, just quickly on that. <laughs> yes, whatever, whatever she will say tomorrow will definitely not uh, be satisfactory to me, but also to all those who are engaged in the climate protection movement, because clearly we need higher ambitions and we need to aim higher than the Commission does. And the reduction of um, the uh, carbon emissions um, up to 55%, as she will present tomorrow, is simply not sufficient and simply not Paris compliant. And that's the problem here. So our future is at stake and the Commission has to be more ambitious. And this is what we will ask. From her. Yeah, just to, to, two, two things that are very important. First, what the UN experts are telling us is that we need exactly 68% uh, reduction by 2030. 55 is far from there. And second of all, there is a trick in the 55%, is that they will change the methodology through which they will calculate the reduction. And they will include carbon capture wells that are important, but still, if you compare the 40% and the 55% and you don't use the same methodology, they will just, in a way, change their accounts. That's a lie, and it's just because they're not taking seriously their responsibility, the EU responsibility, into climate change. And again, when they're you know, talking about uh, the, the, uh, their next generation EU, which is the name of the um, uh, Plan de Relance in yeah. French. Uh, the relaunch plan. The relaunch plan. They actually, for me, it's a joke, because the next generation of the EU will be the one paying economically the price, we've talked about it, and ecologically the price. So they're so hypocrites of saying, of talking about the next ge generation because, because they're really geopardizing or uh, the next generation in the EU. And, and all this in the midst of a pandemic, which you can also trace back to uh, uh, climate as well. Just very uh, last point. The, the migration will be something that she might mention. To, she will mention tomorrow because of the fire in Moria. But then they will unveil the migration pact next Wednesday, not the week after, because of the of the urgency. What they what they deem as the urgency. But last night, Martin, you saw the minister of migration and Mas asylum from Greece. What did you get from that meeting? <clears throat> well. First of all, I think we all share the sentiment that there is something horrible going on at Lesbos and other Greek islands and that not only the fires in Moria but the whole migration regime is a complete failure actually and we have to, we have to recognize that and we have to overcome that and we have to name, name this Europe's shame because we are always referring to human rights and to basic human rights like the right to asylum etc and this is broken every day at the European borders and this is completely unacceptable and what happened yesterday well first of all uh, it has been actually a very interesting uh, talk and meeting because the idea obviously now is to build a new camp but that just means to maintain the same problem and maintain the same situation and not resolve the issue, the real issue that is at stake. And what we need to do is to come to a new migration policy, a European migration policy. And here again, I do not believe that the proposal that will be put forward by the Commission in a couple of days, maybe even tomorrow, some we don't know yet. That's of it, Wednesday. In, the, in, the, in her speech, yeah. will be sufficient um, to deal with this burning issue and to actually save lives of thousand people that try um, to find refuge in the European Union. Um, both of you will be seeing Margarita Skinas tomorrow, the commissioner, uh, the Greek commissioner, who has a horrible title that I won't mention. <laughs> uh, but he will try to explain what he saw from the helicopter uh, over the weekend over Moria. <laughs> so what, what, what is your view on 
is anything going to change? Because the leaks we get from NGOs is that the new policy will just be another deterrent. Nothing well, will change. Yeah, they, I think they, you know, earlier on we were talking about solidarity, and that's precisely what's missing in a migration policy because we just uh, letting Greece trying to deal with the issue. But just to give you one data that helps understanding that it's, it will be easy to deal with it. If each of the EU country would welcome 480 families, each of the country, so imagine like in one city it might be not even one family. So for, for those you know, watching us, like imagine in, in your city just one family, it's nothing. Well then, you know, there, would, there wouldn't be any Moria camp. So I can't even imagine that you know, those governing the EU are looking at those families and saying, yes, well, continue living in these very poor conditions. They tend to forget sometimes, you know, that they're just human beings. And instead of watching them from above, they should probably talk to them and remember that they're people like us. And um, there might be even more people in the future if we don't do anything about climate change, for example. So all of those things are connecting. And what is connected, all of those policies is also a call for dignity and humanity. And I feel like they're missing it, maybe because they're just they spend too much time in, in, in closed office and they should go out of this very nice parliament. And that's our role as the GUE Angel group. We try to go out of the parliament and actually talk to people and bring their voice here in the parliament. With both feet on the ground and one in the parliament and one on the street. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> our mentor. Uh, we're selling arms <laughs> to uh, conflicts in the Middle East as well, which, uh, which is another big topic. Then as a former defense minister, she might even talk about it again tomorrow. Uh, from the line. So thank you to Manon, thank you to Martin, thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>